Um, hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank I'm, you for being here. Yeah. So last minute. It's I'm amazing. very excited. Uh, I have to say, Sam Barry, the editor-in-chief of Glamour, was supposed to be here, and she is absolutely devastated that she can't. Um, and she was texting me frantically from the tarmac. Um, That's so stressful. <laughs> God, plane travel can be so stressful. Yeah. Yeah. She had something really important that she wanted me to share with you and with everybody else here. Um, she was just hanging out with George Clooney yesterday, as you do. As you do. <laughs> um, In Boston. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, this is, I think, let's talk about your path to acting because it's related to this George Clooney quote that I absolutely must get right and I cannot forget. So I'm doing it right now. Um, so she was talking to him about you, and I think they were watching the show last night, um, and she wanted to know what he thought of you. And he said, <clears throat> quote, before I ever had a daughter, Shailene was my daughter, and I couldn't be prouder to be friends with her. Hmm. I do call him my old man. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> what was yeah. it like, like growing up in that environment? You know, I didn't grow up with movies. I started acting when I was five, so it's always been something I've done, but I weirdly and strangely didn't watch TV or film. I watched Romancing the Stone and Dirty Dancing and Pretty Woman. No, just in my childhood, like in general. And we listened to country music and that was it. Like we didn't really have a very cultural home when it came to art. Um, so we, we kind of just watched the same things over and over again. And so when I worked with George, I knew who he was because I'd seen Oh Brother, Where Out There. I was 18. But other than that, I, I didn't really know him as George Clooney, this incredible famous movie star. I knew him as George Clooney, the prankster, who would rather talk to like the crafty guys on set, not the actors or the producers. And that was the relationship that we initially created and also then I think catapulted the way that I would handle future movie sets that I was on in more of a leading capacity. So did you see him as sort of a mentor? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, absolutely. At, at 18, I didn't talk, to, I didn't think about him as a mentor. Like yeah. that wasn't the narrative or the role that I placed him in. For me, it was, it was like he was a kind of a, a father in a way, not an actual father, but he, he had the role of um, big brother dad in the way where I could go, this is making me uncomfortable, I'm not sure about this. Uh, putting me in uncomfortable positions sometimes that forced me out of my shell. And, and there was just always this sort of symbiotic, deep care and playfulness to our relationship. That sounds great. And he obviously has tremendous respect for you and, and the work that you've been doing. I'm very lucky. You know, he was the guy who, at, on The Descendants, was like, look, not every, actually no other films that you ever are on will be like this. We're filming in Hawaii for five months with Alexander Payne. And you're filming with me, you're working with me. <laughs> we're, we're working 10, 11 hour days, which never happens. And we're all barbecuing at night together. He's like, this will never ever exist. So you need to soak up this experience. And then you also need to watch basically what me and Alexander are creating because on any film set that you're ever on, it's always the director and number one on the call sheet. Those are the two people who set the tone for the day and for the entire experience. And I didn't know exactly what he meant by that until I was sort of in that role doing the Divergent movies. And I recognized that if I showed up in a shitty mood or if a director showed up in a shitty mood, it would trickle down to every single person on that set. And you really have to, you have to make sure that not only are you passionate about what you do, but you share that and you don't let any of the noise and the BS that comes with a lot of this industry get in the way of why, the why of you being there. Right, right. Um, it's, it's a leadership basically. Yeah, and just and and being humble and having fun and remembering that you know it takes thousands of people to make a movie work, right. including the people who end up watching it. You know, you can't. It's one of the only art forms that takes so many elements and people and manpower and woman power to come together to create that final product. And the minute that you think you're above or worth more or whatever it is, the hierarchy of this business is something I'll never understand. Um, but the minute that that becomes something that you inhale and ingrain within your own bones, then it sets the whole thing off. Um, what is, what's been your favorite role to date? Uh, I don't, I don't have a favorite one. Do you just the say that all the time? What, that I don't have a favorite one? <laughs> Do you actually not have a favorite one? No, or? I really don't. Like, because for me, it's not about the roles, it's about the story. Okay. Um, Adrift was very meaningful to me. Not a lot of people saw it, but that was, the, we filmed the entire thing, virtually the entire thing, all but two weeks. 
in the middle of the ocean on a sailboat with maybe 10 or 15 crew members. Um, Do you get seasick? Well, we all did, yeah, for the first couple of days until we got our sea life. We were literally puking, and, like, it was awful, but they'd be, like, rolling, and Sam and I would puke off the side of the boat, and then we'd wipe our mouths, and we'd do the scene, they'd say, cut, and we'd all puke again, and the sound guy was, like, we have no sound in half of the movie because the sound guy was puking the whole time, and hair and makeup, like, it was a disaster. It was a complete disaster. We had a 19-year-old PA, female PA, end up becoming kind of like our first AD who was running the entire set because we were in the middle of the ocean and we couldn't get anyone else out there and she ended up smashing it. But it was just, it took, it was like an all in thing. And this you was know? your favorite? Yeah. <laughs> I love the ocean. I love the ocean. So that was really magical, but all of them have their own pieces. Like I wouldn't say Divergent was my favorite acting experience by any means. Um, or creative experience by any means, but it was an amazing learning experience and bonding experience. Like what we were, it was kind of like being in a frat or a sorority for a short period of time. There's a bunch of young kids together stuck in Chicago in the middle of winter trying to make this movie work and then having fun together and then also the green screen element and the special effects element. That was a whole educational piece in and, in and of itself. Okay. Um what what do you think's been the biggest challenge as far as the role? I mean, would it be the puking over the boat? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think I think Big Little Lies, in a lot of ways, has actually been really challenging. What's um, been challenging about it? Because it is so. Because the subject matters that we're dealing with are so personal. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if anyone in here d cannot relate to this statement that I'm gonna make, but I don't know one person who has neither experienced domestic abuse or sexual abuse themselves or someone that they know very closely, whether it's a family member or best friend. Um, so it feels so personal and because there's so many incredible leads, there's a limited amount of time to really dig into what deeply matters and how do we explore those things while also including levity and including like proper human psychology, which isn't always just dark and deep and mm -hmm. morose, you know, there's a lot of different layers and complexities. And so I think trying to just capture everything that I wanted to capture with Jane in maybe 10 minutes throughout the entire episode has been just challenging. And how do you prepare for that? You don't really, I mean, the, the thing about the character that I played, you know, she was raped when she was younger and got pregnant and had, had the child. Um, I hope I'm not ruining anything for anybody. <laughs> but um, that's all, that all comes pretty quick in the first season. She, you know, I don't, again, like I don't know, I have many friends in my close circle who have very similar stories in their lives and family as well. So it's not, it wasn't that I had to do a lot of research. It really was um, just putting myself so completely, oopsies, in Jane's shoes and how I would react given her circumstances. Do you find that fans of the show come up to you and, and share their experiences yeah. with you? I'll never, I mean, it makes me wanna cry. Oh my God, so crazy. I had a family member, he's not a close family member, but close enough, uh, send me photos of her bruises all over her body right before we started filming season two. And I don't know her very well, because we're not, she's not in my immediate family. But I was, I had no idea. And she was like, your show has given me the confidence to talk to you guys and my friends and try and get out of this relationship. Oh, wow. And it still took a while, you know, like d domestic abuse is complicated and yeah. it's what we see in the show. Um, but that was, I've heard a lot of stories, but that was kind of the most intimate and uh, impactful one. Because the minute that you see something visually, you just, you kind of, you don't really know what to do with it, except know that what you're doing actually matters more than just simple storytelling. Right. Um, so it, it's obviously, the show obviously delves into very dark, serious topics, but it's also kind of funny, right? This season <laughs> yeah. is so funny, and I've only <laughs> seen one episode, but it was so funny. Because I think, I mean, I think the first season had its moments yeah. of being funny, especially yeah. with Reese's character. Yeah. But this season is very, like Laura Dern takes it to a whole nother level <laughs> in season two. 
have you learned, I mean, you work with just this incredible superstar cast. Um, what have you learned from each of them? So much. Um, we're all, you know, we're all very different people and we're all from different generations, especially with Meryl now. We have like three kind of distinct generational uh, journeys that all are coexisting. And the beautiful thing about all of us is that we genuinely like each other. We don't just kind of faux Hollywood like each other. We really do. Help. Um, which helps a lot and usually doesn't happen. Uh, and we're also not afraid. We're really good at holding space for one another despite the in, like the differences that we have. What which, does that mean? For example, politically, we're, when we're at dinner, we're not just, you know, talking, oh, that's a, why? When we're at dinner, we're not just talking about, uh, I guess, surface level things. We're kind of women who just get in there and go deep very quickly, whether it's emotional conversations or political conversations. And oftentimes, we have disagreements about how we think things should get done. We always have the same goal in mind and the same um, solution or the same idea for a solution, but we, we aren't necessarily in agreement of the steps that we need to take to get there. And that's what I mean by holding space, because I could be very adamant about one particular cause or one particular way of getting something done. And Reese may disagree about that, but I can hold the space and support her journey and she can do the same for mine. And I, I've learned a lot from them in that way, because that's how me and my friends outside of this industry work together. But I've never met a group of women in this industry who can do that together with transparency and authenticity and, and honesty. And respect, it sounds. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. still trying to wrap my head around hold space for each other. Like, does that hold mean space. just... I suppose, like, um, you can tell me... Hold, I don't need to tell you how I feel, but you can tell me how you feel. And I'm going to be here, and I'm going to hold that space for you, and I can not say um, you're wrong. I guess holding space and like the definition in my mind is the is gray. That's yeah. the gray area, right? If you're able to like hold space for grayness, <laughs> then you're not. I think so many of our issues that we're all so freaking black and white in our views and our opinions and our steadfast dedication to what we think is right and wrong, and what that ultimately does is create immense amounts of um, apathy and lack of empathy and lack of compassion and that's what we really kind of aim to do in our, our group. That sounds really nice. We, it's really nice. We were talking backstage a little bit um, where I, you know, I was talking about maybe I would ask you about what it's like to work with all these strong women and you were like, okay, if you must, you can ask that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not your favorite question. So I'd like to know both the answer to it and also why it frustrates you. It frustrates me because right now in and I'll, I offend people all the time by saying this, but right now in Hollywood, the, the conversation that I often have with journalists, especially with Big Little Eyes, is, um, you know, how do you feel about playing a strong, empowered female? Or it's so amazing to see the show about strong, empowered females. And I'm like, is it? Are they strong? Are they empowered? Or are they just like broken, hurting, messy, complicated, funny, corrupt, abrupt, human beings who are women and who don't have their shit together and who are trying to get their shit together, which is why they're bringing, sorry, I just see movement, I can't tell what it is, which is why they're bringing, you know, the show about, like, to really explore human and female psychology, and that's kind of why I get triggered by it, because I think that there's a common narrative surrounding female-based projects, which have the word strong and empowered, and sometimes 10 minutes of the day on a Tuesday afternoon, you might feel really strong as yeah. a woman. And five minutes later, you might feel really vulnerable and sensitive and weak. And I think it's the same for men, you know, like these sort of catchphrase things that we throw on there to uplift the idea of equality and justice. That's not actually addressing like the real situation, which is there's a learning curve and how we can all communicate properly together to achieve the equality that we're really aiming to achieve. Mm -hmm. And that's why that conversation or that question can Bothers trigger me. You. That's interesting. It's funny because we actually we have a, a rule at self that you can't call anything empowering unless it is genuinely empowering. Yeah, um, because it's like it's this word that has become kind of meaningless to some extent. Yeah, And you take away the power from it, which yeah. is it's a powerful word. Yeah. 
Um, so okay, we don't have to answer that question. <laughs> but what I do love about it, <laughs> what I do love about it, um, is that you do just have like the camaraderie and you have like the, but also I have to say, it's not just a female cast. We have some amazing males in this cast as well. Yeah, I mean, the whole cast is just mind blowing. Yeah, <laughs> Incredible. it's bananas. Um, you looked pretty different uh, in, the, in the episode last night. Can you talk about the hair change? Yeah, I mean, for Jane always, like in season one and in this season, I really wanted to change my body. Like I wanted to hold myself different and I wanted to, because when I've had moments in my life of extreme trauma, you do hold yourself differently and you, um, you know, every, everything, so your hormones change, your stress level changes. Second season, after what happens in season one, I sort of felt like Jane had this cataclysmic uh, release and I, feel like for myself when something extreme happens I'll get like a piercing or I'll cut my hair or like I'll do some weird body morphing thing yeah. because it's all it's a way to mark I guess my new territory of self yeah within my own psyche and I felt like for her it was a way to redefine her identity as her own identity separate from sorry separate from the event that occurred in in season one. Yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, I saw the different hair and immediately thought of like breakup haircuts or totally. like what you do when you're marking the end of something and the beginning of something new, like yeah. rearrange the furniture and change your hair. Exactly. Um, which sounds really shallow, but actually I think is really relatable. Did you make that choice? I did. I went to them and I said, I think that I should cut my hair and I couldn't dye or I couldn't like do a different color or anything because of something I was doing right after Big Little Eyes. So I was like, what if we give her bangs? Because yeah. that's dramatic, it's a big change. Yeah. And it's also something that often, when you have these breakup haircuts, sometimes you look in the mirror two weeks later and you're like, what the fuck did I do? Why <laughs> did I cut my hair? And I wanted to do something to her where like, in a couple of weeks she could have had the opportunity to be like, that was dumb, but <laughs> glad I have these bangs now. Right. For now. Yeah. <laughs> what Until if, I have to trim cool. them. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, very relatable. Um, I'm trying. Uh, what did you think when you found out that Meryl Streep would be joining the cast? I thought it was very, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> a little excited? Um, just a little tad bit. No, I was really, I mean, similarly, honestly, to my experience with George, I still haven't seen very many movies. So I have seen Mamma Mia, and um, I've seen her, her, her greatest, yeah. Uh, no, I've, I've seen, you know, of course, a few Meryl Streep movies, but I haven't seen all of them by yeah. any means. And I'd ran into her a couple times at award shows and just saw the way that she held herself and the way that she effortlessly and gracefully shared her true self with people. Um, so I was just really excited. I was also really excited to learn from her as an actor. You know, I, th I come from a background in acting where I haven't been classically trained. I didn't go to school for acting. For me, it's just about truly professionally listening to each and every moment and then authentically reacting. But Meryl, you know, every single role that she does is a performance that still is somehow natural. And that was something that I feel like is a weak point in my, like that's something I'm not great at. And I was excited to work opposite her to kind of just learn by osmosis and, and really study her, which we got to do. There's a two the towards the end of the season. There's a few episodes where Meryl and Nicole have some incredible scenes, and the rest of us just got to sit there and watch for about a week straight. Them do this thing over and over and over again. And <laughs> me and Zoe were sort of pinching each other and ourselves, going, "This is like a master class in acting," and like taking notes in between. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, did you you enjoyed working with her? I assume. Yeah, so much. So much because she really, like, she did teach me. I'm, I'm not the same actor after working with Meryl. Do you have anything specific that you feel like, I learned that and I learned that from Meryl Streep? Yes. She knows <laughs> every single person's lines, not just herself. Like, she knows my lines and Nicole's lines and Reese's lines and probably the dog's bark. Like, she knows <laughs> it all. And she also knows it all before you commence production, which I learned my lines the night before for each scene the next day and then I forget them by the time I get to the next day. But she knows the entire script. I'll never, I say this all the time, but my favorite memory working with her was at the very end of, I think episode seven, it was right at the very end of the whole thing. 
And she comes up and it's all of us ladies sitting together and she goes, I wonder what this line on page three has to do with this line on page 50 or whatever it was. And she walked away just like, hmm. And we all like looked <laughs> and she found this through line and this very important button and beat for the entire episode that none of us picked up on, noticed, thought about. And she just, you know, like she, she really knows how to dissect a script. And the other thing that I thought was so beautiful about her was she has so much respect for the writer uh. of the project. Even if she doesn't love writing or if she doesn't just like agree with some character choices or dialogue choices, she, like the script is like a, the Bible for her. And she, um, she does everything she can to pay justice to that, not what her idea of it should be, but to what it is and then how she can make it work. And I thought that was very special because I'm very accustomed to working with actors who go, this is shitty, I know better, and I'm gonna do my thing, kind of fuck y'all. And that was really, <laughs> truly, but that was really, you know, um, it was special to see her at her level give so much respect to every other artist and collaborate so much with every other artist to where she's just honoring them. Mm -hmm. She's in service to the story instead of having the story be in service to her performance. Got it. And so does that mean that you're gonna be memorizing everyone's lines for everything you do going I forward? I think it means no, but <laughs> I think it means that I'll be paying more attention to the entire kind of unit and story as a whole and trying to really find those beats and those um, buttons because that's not something that my brain has ever been trained to do. That's cool. That's, yeah. That sounds like an amazing experience. It was. Um, and this is kind of broad, but how and in what ways has the show changed your life? Um, I mean, I have five new really awesome lady friends, which is very, very cool and very special. Um, and then apart from that, you know, I don't, I'm from California, so every time a building moves in New York, I'm like, we're having an earthquake. <laughs> and it's probably just the Is subway. Right now? There was just a little shake, sorry. <laughs> it's probably something only an LA person it's fine. would notice. It's fine. Um, I, that's such a good question. I don't know. I, I think it's, I don't know. I really, I really disassociate actually from projects and my personal life because I feel like so much of what we do isn't sacred in so many ways or personal that I hold on to my lifestyle and my personal life with everything I have and then come in and do the thing and be on film sets and do the thing. But I don't know. I could say like a drift changed my life because I was in the middle of, the, of nature for five months and I got to like commune with like dolphins and the sun and how can that not change your life? But on Big Little Lies, I feel like it was more about just gaining like the like true friendships in Hollywood. That's lovely. Yeah. Um, besides Big Little Lies, what else are you working on right now? Right now I'm not working on anything. Oh, how nice. <laughs> it's kind of nice. Um, but I did do a movie late last year that will be out probably later this year called No, 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 Yes. Title might change, so I don't know. That's the current title. Uh, but it was a Drake Dreamus movie who did that film like crazy. Um, he did a movie Newness with Nicholas Holt, which was amazing a couple years ago. And the, but the, our whole entire movie was improvised. The whole was thing was improvised. Wild. The whole thing. Talked about him. Is it that was, new for you? Have you done that yeah. before? Oh no, I'd never done it. And the best part is I was filming, so it's with Sebastian Stan and Jamie Dornan, who are both incredible actors and amazing human beings. And I was overseas and I got a call and they were like, it was from the director and his producer or someone. And he was like, hey, our lead actress dropped out. Can you fly to LA in a, like two days and do this movie? And it's like, please. That's amazing. <laughs> I was like, There's no lines sure. you have to memorize, so it's fine. Well, I was like, sure, can I read the script? And they yeah. sent the script, and I called him back, and I was like, it's all improvised. Like, I don't know anything about what this, he's like, yeah, it'll be fun, just come, it'll be an adventure. And I was like, oh, all right, sure. So I came, I did the movie, and as soon as I landed, our first scene was filmed in Big Sur. And I was like, Drake, you know, we should, to bond, we should get in a car together and just drive up to Big Sur instead of flying up there. So me, him, and Sebastian drove six hours to Big Sur, and that was how we kind of all got to know each other and also decided what the movie was kind of gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was an outline, like this, he, I'm, I'm exaggerating, there was an outline of the whole thing, but it would say like, you're sitting on stage together and you ask her a question like, 
what are you working on next? And you say something like this, go. And then you, we just kind of played for 22 days. That's like my worst nightmare. It like was actually. my worst nightmare until we started doing it. And then it became really beautiful because you just are, it's, the mo- it's definitely the most honest thing I've ever done in, and raw. So, but, so you had a character and, and a, her- a character background. So you were basically yeah. pulling from that character. What would this character say or was it loose? Well, that, that was the confusing part because there were so many <laughs> things that she would not do that I would do or, some, or vice versa. But the director was like, I want it to just be honest, like do what you would do. And I'm like, but I'm not Daphne. Like mm-hmm. I would not do that. <laughs> and he's like, well, just try and make it work. And and we did somehow, but I think, you know, like when you put yourself with another actor, you're also like feeding off of their energy and what they're giving. And so there was a lot of it that was not real, but for the most part, it's just all of us as, as ourselves talking to each other. That sounds um, very stressful, but also very interesting. It was very vulnerable. Yeah. It was very, very vulnerable. And thank God both of them were and are incredible men, because I think that that would have been... It, it could have been a trickier situation, but um, yeah, we all just kind of got loose and vulnerable with each other. Interesting. Um, you've mentioned that you've learned a lot from, quote, rebellious women in Hollywood when you were younger. Can you give an example of what that means? Did I say rebellious or did somebody else say that? I did. I worked with, so it all started with, I mean, it really started with Marsha Gay Harden when I was 13. Um, and, and I don't remember much about that except that she had like her daughter on set and in a role with her and it was like very much a family affair. And then when I was on Secret Life, which, uh, was an interesting experience for six years of my life, um, Molly Ringwald played my mom and there was a lot of things that happened on that set that were not okay and that were incredibly traumatic and very negative experiences that um, Molly really stepped in and created an environment for me as a child actor, as a teenager, to love what I did even if I didn't agree with how it was being done. Um, And she protected me in a lot of ways and I saw how much she had to face being someone where every single time somebody saw her, they were like, oh, 16 Candles. You know, her entire life still to this day was something that people would, would mention to her and, and see her as, and her ability to identify with that, but also identify so strongly with her within herself as a mother, as a wife, as an author, as a, success, a successful author, was really, it, it changed the way that I looked at what being an actor had to be. Mm -hmm. And when I would go to her house and see how she functioned with her family, it changed the narrative of what I thought success and fame and all of that meant. Um, She really, I think, shaped my life in more ways than I am aware of. Mm -hmm. I think subconsciously she created a lot of who I am today. And then it rolled into um, Ashley Judd and Kate Winslet, who are both people who have always been outspoken about their beliefs and Again, whether or not I agree with them on some stances, like they aren't afraid. They aren't afraid of a machine that has told them they needed to be something and told them they should have been something. And if you become a mom, you'll never work again. And if you take a year off, you'll never work again. And if you live in the South, you'll never work again. And they took all of those, those, those things that agents and producers say to you to incite fear for some dumb reason. Um, and they threw them out and they have lived their lives and continue to be successful and are much happier than most people I know because they have created a lifestyle that caters to them Mm -hmm. instead of to an idea of what it should be. Yeah, and I feel like we've kind of danced around the topic a little bit um, about kind of making a life for yourself separate from your your career, Um, whether that's like focusing on your home life or, but basically you, you mentioned earlier that when you're not working, you're like basically completely, completely not working. Yeah. Um, what does, is that intentional? Is that like, this is how you take care of yourself? Is this part of your wellness practice? Um, or is it just kind of how it goes? I think I've discovered in therapy that, um, so my, because I started when I was five, my mom was very much always a part of my act, like acting life. When I got my manager, she helped make the decision with me. and. It was always a team thing, and in my early 20s, 
I had to sit her down and be like, I'm cutting you out of the conversation um, because I need my mom as my mom and I need my career to be my career. And it was really hard for her, not because she wanted to manage anything at all, but because she was like, but I've just like, this has been my life too, you know? Like she would work f a full day and then drive me to auditions for hours. And it was hard for me because she helped, she was the middleman in a lot of awkward situations. And we had to find that new balance. But what I recognized in the last couple of years, like that distinction that I made then, which I thought I was only making with my family and with work, like saying, when I come home, guys, I don't really want to talk about what it was like to be here. I want to talk about, or be there. I want to talk about, like, how's your heart? How's the dog? How's the kitchen? You know, all the dumb stuff that you talk about as a family. Um, and I didn't realize until years later when my brother was like, you kind of shut us out of like what's going on in your career. You don't tell us when things happen. And it was, I think, like a self-protection mechanism of of needing to not like remember who I am like I not it is that but like really you know I don't come from money and I don't come from famous people and I don't come from um people who are I guess in the limelight or trying to be in the limelight I come from like very like normal suburban kind of family and that is where my true joy lies and that's where I receive the most joy and so separating the two is important for me because I think it if I only lived in this I wouldn't remember my joy mm -hmm. and if I only lived in this then I wouldn't have my career so needing to kind of create two worlds and I think as I get older it'll be easier for me to integrate them together but it was a you know it's a hard journey I think it's it can be lonely if you aren't if you aren't lucky enough to have people around you who are your true friends and family. Yeah, um, I love that you mentioned your therapist. Um, when did you decide to start talking about that openly? Well, I just, so I, both my parents are therapists. Um, so I grew up with this shit. Um, it was like, oh, they bullied you in school. Well, how do you think they feel at home when they're bullied by their parents? And you're like, mom, can you just like give me a break? Um, so they're both psychologists, but I, I went through therapy. My parents got divorced when I was 14 and my brother and I were kind of thrown into therapy to like save the kids. And I hated it because I hated my therapist. Like we just really, we didn't click. She didn't help me with anything. She made me feel uncomfortable. And throughout the rest of my life, I kind of was like, well, therapy is for some people, but I don't think I need it. And then something happened for me around Christmas this year that was really, um, really, really, really emotionally difficult and has been for a long time. But it was sort of the, the catalyst for me going, I need help. I can't do this alone and I'm going crazy. So I, I knew of this therapist because he was the husband of one of my doctors. And I ended up working with him. And my, like the first session I sat down and I felt so uncomfortable and so vulnerable. But he was like, you know, if we're gonna do this, we need to create some sort of trust immediately. It doesn't mean that you have to trust me, but you're gonna, that you say you can trust the process. And I said, I can't trust the process, but I'm willing to try. And um, it was amazing. I mean, it is amazing. And openly, like I, I would have talked about it openly years ago had I been doing therapy years ago. You, ha you have talked a lot about wellness and the importance of wellness to you. Um, I, you've also made jokes about previous things that you've said. And um, how, has your, how has your relationship with wellness changed over time? So my journey with wellness was I started studying herbalism when I was still in high school for some weird reason. And um, was fascinated by how indigenous cultures around the world could run like into their 80s. And how in America, my uncle at 30 couldn't run anymore because he had some joint problem in his knee. And so that's why I started studying herbalism. And then from there, I started studying nutrition, et cetera. And it really was all sparked by the indigenous thing, but also by just environmentalism and recognizing how like big agriculture was destroying our world and how none of us were really talking about it. And this was before like... When you use the word recycling, people said you were a hippie. You know, like recycling was a big, crazy, woo-woo thing. Um, <laughs> and then I watched being from L.A., how quickly the conversation and narrative was changing. And it went from being, you know, this is sort of taboo to all of a sudden kale juice on every corner and 
um, you know, pay attention to this because it's really good for you and eat charcoal because it binds, blah, blah, blah. All of the information was out there. And I was also watching this whole movement take off, including myself take off with it, and how the narrative for me went from something that I was doing because I was like actually wanting to help soil exist in 50 years to being very worried about how long I was gonna live. And in my mid 20s, like every, I kind of, I got too stressed with it and I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm traveling on planes too much, and la la la. And I was like, what are you doing? This is so narcissistic to care so deeply about yourself in this space when A, it's a very privileged thing, su super privileged thing to be able to afford half that stuff or even think about half that stuff because you have the time to. Um, but also, like the whole conversation about wellness for me, if we're talking about like physical, not mental, because that's a whole nother conversation, but should be directed towards what are we doing to preserve and conserve this planet? Not what am I doing in order to make sure I look youthful at 50 years old instead of looking like a 50 year old woman who's lived a great ass life. Um, so that, that sort of shifted my perspective on the wellness thing. And now it's something that I, is in, it's, in, it's who I am. I can't go anywhere without being aware of it. But also, like, I'll eat a milk bar cookie because that shit's delicious, you know? Really good. But, like, really good. being very mindful of, you know, how and what that decision will mean for the earth. Um, let's talk about environmentalism and your work uh, with politics and activism, which I know you're not a huge fan of the, the term activist. Can you, can you go into that a little bit? I think for me, it, it's just become something that's like very, it's kind of like the word empowered. Thank you. Um, it, it feels like the word empowered, where it loses its weight and its gravity, because we're kind of just throwing it out here, like left and right at the moment. Um, you post something on social media and all of a sudden you're an activist when people day in and day out are living their lives on the front lines in their small communities and never see the light of a camera or the attention of the media or any journalist giving two shits about what they're doing but who are actually making profound differences for future generations and for their towns. And so I guess it's just the way that we use that word that really matters to me. Um, and then for myself, like I never ever considered myself an activist. That was definitely a label that Hollywood has given me. But it's just about doing things that matter. And if you have the time and the space, do it. I'll never forget my um, mom's best friend from high school. They grew up with nothing. I don't know why I'm telling this story, but I, it has changed my life. So um, they grew up with nothing. And at like 18 years old, they were kicked out of their houses because they got married very young. And they came from conservative places and basically worked their asses off and did some tech thing and got a lot of money. And they moved over state or to a different state. We were visiting them when I was 11 and they, have, they had a lot of money. And we were at this restaurant and it was like $11 pasta. And I was like, mom, can I order the pasta? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, it's $11. And she's like, it's okay, they're paying. And so <laughs> order the pasta. And at, I was sitting next to our friend, and at the end, the bill came, and it was probably like $200 or $300, and it was the biggest bill I'd ever seen. And in the tip line, he put in, two, let's say if it was 300 bucks, he put 300 in the tip. And I was like, no, 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 like that's the tip line. Like that's, you don't have to, and he's like, Shay, when you can, you do. And it really impacted me as this young person, and not from a financial standpoint of, you know, needing to have money to do something, but just the essence of that, like, if you can do something, then fucking do it because this world needs it. And that's, I guess, my frustration with that word is true activism is action. It's not sort of this strange 2D world that we're living in where we're kind of existing in these echo chambers of, like most of the people I follow on Instagram are telling me the things I wanna hear. The things that I post on Instagram are probably going to people who wanna hear the same things that I believe. And, and I just think that what's really gonna incite change is if we get uncomfortable and we put ourselves in positions to just speak to understand and speak to listen, instead of saying, again, you're right, I'm wrong. Like, finding that space, you know? <laughs> that gray area. <laughs> Got it. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your work with Conservation International? And what, when did you join and what their mission is? Yeah, they're amazing. And a lot of people in America don't know about them because they spend all their money 
actually doing the real work, which is incredible. Um, but they're an amazing environmental conservation organization, and their main mission is conservation. I mean, their only mission is conservation, which I really appreciate because they're not using these fear-based words of climate change, global warming, where it's all going to shit, like we're kind of helpless, give us your money so that we can change the world or save the planet or help the planet. It's really about letting nature heal nature in the same way that when you're sick, chances are if you let yourself just sleep for two days, you'll be, you'll get better versus, you know, we're constantly trying to live these crazy lives and also pump shit into our bodies. And so that's their mission, that's their theory, and they're in all of these different countries around the world, um, not just America, with people on, and employees on the ground, and they act as the bridge between politicians and the government and then communities, grassroots, and indigenous leaders on the ground. They're pretty awesome, you should check them out. They're called a Conservation International. And uh, I think that they do the real work. And I'm not usually a huge fan of major corporate NGOs or charities, et cetera, but these guys are, um, they're doing the thing and they're doing the thing right. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, one last question before I get to the, the audience questions. Um, you drew headlines uh, with your arrest at the Dakota, Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, do you feel that you have a responsibility to, to use your platform in this way? Um, well, that wasn't planned. I just felt very, I felt very lucky to have my platform with Standing Rock. I mean, the way Standing Rock came into my life was in January of 2016, I was with a friend um, who got a call from another friend from Standing Rock, it was Ezra Miller, got a call from Standing Rock and said like, hey, we could use some help can you like use your platform to get this message out because we're trying to get this petition signed to stop this. But it was all started, like the whole Standing Rock movement, which nobody knows about, was started by the youth, by the 13 year olds, 12 year olds, 11 year olds of Standing Rock. And they're who contacted Ezra. Ezra said yes, I happened to be in a car with him and he was like, hey Shay, would you like, are you interested in this? And I said yes and um, it kind of just, had, like we sort of just got involved from there. And then when I got arrested, cut to many, many months later, and now thousands and thousands of people paying attention to it, I just felt lucky to have a Facebook Live that I could stream to 50,000 people in that exact moment of arrest because that's kind of what was able to be shared. And that whole story, is, it's just, it's crazy, you know? It took a white, non-indigenous, well-known actor to get arrested to bring a lot of attention to this thing that had already had hundreds of indigenous people arrested and I think that in and of itself for me was sort of the, the major, it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor for the entire thing. Did that make you feel weird? I mean like... Absolutely it did, you know, a thousand percent. It's, but it's, it's the way that we have always treated Native Americans since colonization. It's, it's the same thing that's always happened. And what was so beautiful about Standing Rock was that people were coming together, but not just like natives and non-natives, but like non-native allies were actually learning, I think for the first time in history, including myself, not only what we suspected was wrong with the history that we grew up with, but what is still wrong with the history that's happening today. You know, it's the same kind of conversation when we come, when it comes to like the private prison system, criminal justice, et cetera, it's all, it's this narrative of, oh, it used to be really bad and it's bad today, but you know, it's not as bad. And then you go, oh yeah, no, this is, this is just as bad. It just has, it's just wearing different clothing and it's wearing a different name, but it's, it's just as bad what we're all a part of, but don't necessarily pay attention to, not because we're ignorant, but because we haven't been educated about it. But the cool thing is once you know, you can't unknow. And I felt like Standing Rock really, really created that knowing. And now it's just a matter of where you go from from here. Um, I actually lied earlier. I'm, these are all about acting and, and a few other things. So I'm going to ask one more political question. Um, I, I'm, you're very passionate about so many things. If you had to choose, what are the three most important topics that you think people should be paying attention to in, in the lead up to next year's election? Um, mental health, <laughs> but like within ourselves. I honestly think, I think the, the three most important things that we should be paying attention to are, 
are you registered and are your neighbors registered first and first, first and foremost and do you have a car to get there if you don't have a car do you have transportation if you don't have transportation is there someone you can ask if there's no one you can ask can you go online i think that's the biggest thing because just getting people to the polls is vital and then the second thing is paying attention to like how your life like what actually brings you what is that show on Netflix that everybody watches where she's like, if it doesn't bring you joy, don't do the thing? Yeah, I'm not trying to sound like her right now. <laughs> but if, like, if something in your life doesn't bring you joy, you know, like, pay attention to what that thing is and then what is the, what is the part of the system that is fueling that? And then pay attention to the policies surrounding that instead of... You know, obviously, like, the main ones that we all pay attention to, like, healthcare, all of these things are incredibly important, obviously. But I do think that there is a lot of power in our hands that we have not recognized because we don't know to ask our politicians about certain things because it just hasn't been something that has been brought up in mass media. But, you know, when I, I went to a lot of states for Bernie Sanders in 2016 and then once he lost was working to help get Hillary elected and I learned so much when I was on the ground talking to people who were, I was like why why would you vote for Bernie or why would you vote for Hillary or why would you vote for Trump and they'd be like oh because you know like uh, they're gonna they're gonna help me get another job and you're like really but how is that gonna happen and is getting another job actually going to help your life or is like there's, I think we just have this misconception of what will bring us true joy and then holding our politicians accountable to that. And so I would say, you know, just discover in your life what's the most meaningful. And despite whatever narratives mass media is trying to throw at us because that's all just noise and distraction. Um, thank you. So some, some audience questions, changing topic a little bit. Great. <laughs> what is Jane's star sign? Mm. Who asked that question? Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. So I started studying astrology a couple years ago. I'm obsessed with it. Um, and so now every, ever since I started studying it, I, every time I have a character, I create a whole chart for them. Like, the whole thing. And it really helps me understand their psychology because I'm like, oh, that's why she's so shy. <laughs> and what's something interesting from Jane's? I mean, for me, like, I... Mm. I think Jane is like a Taurus. Like I really see her being like her sun sign is a Taurus, but then having like some Sag in there somewhere because I think like she can be really funny. And I think that she's got some like Aquarius in there as well because I think the way that she sees the world and its possibilities is a little bit different. But the biggest thing for her that was interesting in building a chart is that she, because of the trauma that she had and the trauma that she holds, like she still has, um, it changes the way that those things are fired off. <laughs> I love it so much. It's such a woo-woo thing. Sometimes people think it is, but I think it's actually really cool. <laughs> I love that you um, thought about this at length. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, but truly, like, so I had, my, I had my chart read when I was in a major moment of depression, major, and I was like, y'all, like, you witch lady are gonna not teach me anything. Like, I don't know what this is gonna be. And she, it's like, she knew me better than anyone, and it really freaked me out. But it also, like, she, to me, astrology just gives you permission to be yourself without judgment. And that's what I've been able to help, I guess, build my characters. <laughs> do what you got to do. That great sounds question. great. And thank you for the question. <laughs> um, is there one character, living or dead, who you would like to play? Yep. Cool. And it's kind of exciting for many reasons that I'm not going to say right now. But it would be Ana Yusnin. Okay. Why? Not even necessarily that I would want to play, but um, she's someone I'd like to be. Uh, because she, uh, she was an amazing French author um, from the 40s, but spanning all the way through the late 70s, early 80s, I believe. Um, to me, she like embodies feminism in the way that like I define feminism. And before it was a thing really for a woman to decide who she wanted sexually and who she wanted emotionally, she was doing it. Um, she was pl 
playing with her identity as far as who she was attracted to and who she wanted to be with. And she basically, she taught me at a, at a young age when I first read her book, Henry and June, which if you haven't read it, is so beautiful, um, what sensuality meant and, and basically changed my sexual uh, direction as far as what I wanted for my body and for my mind for the rest of my life. What was so, book? It's called Henry and June. Mm, I have to remember that. You just see a woman discovering who she is sexually and psychologically. I say she discovers who she is psycholo psychologically through her sexuality. Okay. Um, it's amazing. If you haven't read it, oh my gosh, you got it. I read. have not read it. I'll have to add it to yeah. the list. Um, I've been reading a lot lately because I've been trying really hard to stay off of Twitter. Oh, that's like, so healthy. <laughs> I hear actually, yeah, I mean, um, with some success, I hear that you actually got rid of your smartphone. I, so I still have my smartphone. I went to Cuba, and a few years ago I didn't have a phone, and it was the best thing ever because there's Wi-Fi everywhere, so if you have a computer, you can talk to any, because now you can text from your computer. It's so crazy. Um, <laughs> but I didn't have a phone, and I noticed once I got it back for the last few years, like, my thumb will start doing the shaky thing sometimes. I'm like, that's not normal, and that must just be from, you like, like, scrolling and thumb? typing. Well, I, I'm a single thumb typer. Oh. I don't type with two hands. Wow. So I think this thumb, is the nerve is just, like, Fuck you. <laughs> like, you're, go you're like, you're using me too much. Um, but that started weirding me out, and then I kind of was playing with the idea of getting rid of it again because I just noticed if I was at a stoplight or on the metro, I'd be on my phone instead of looking at people around me on the subway. Like, I used to have conversations with people, and now I would just be looking at old photos. It, just, it wasn't always even Instagram. It'd be dumb old emails that I wasn't even going to respond to, but was just reading them for who knows why. <laughs> Um, but then I went to Cuba and my phone just stopped working and I got back and I was like, huh, all right, I guess that just did it for me. And so I have it and it works on Wi-Fi, but I got rid of the data on it and I have a flip phone now for data, which has really helped my mental health in so many ways. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm far more present. I um, also feel like being online so much just fills me with rage. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> and also insecurity. Like I'm, I'm a very sensitive human being. Um, and I get insecure very easily. I'm sure like all of us do. And so the minute, I mean, I just feel like Instagram can be amazing in a lot of ways because it can kind of like m help make movements move and yeah. introduce new hashtag things. But, <laughs> um, but it's also like, you know, it's a, it's a condensed form of you're not good enough. And it can be a condensed form of you're not good enough. And if it was starting to bother like my psychology in that way, I couldn't help but think like how that was affecting young girls and young boys. And then I saw the fire festival documentaries and I was like, oh, fuck this shit. This is terrifying. Like, you know, just like the whole thing of like, it's just, the, it just, it just weirds me out, man. It's weird. And I'm as much a part of it as much as I like, don't like it, I also have it and use it, and so it's just this weird thing. So the flip phone has helped create distance. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Very impressive. <laughs> Maybe I'll try that. Probably but I mean, the flip phone that. has a hotspot, so if I need internet, I can still. Have it. <laughs> it's perfect. You, you can't really escape. It. I tried to delete Twitter off my phone, and then I put it on like the fourth screen, you know. So I have to like so, but it's, yeah. it's still anyway. Yeah, you can't problem. escape it. No, you can't. It's like trying to hide the cookies. You still know where the cookies are. <laughs> True. Um, <laughs> how alike do you think you are with your character in Big Little Lies on a personal level? Mm, I think we're pretty different. We're very similar, I think, in the sense of being blunt. Like, I think Jane will just kind of say what she feels, and I will as well. But I sort of do the dance of like, oh, I don't want to be rude, and la la la. And Jane, I think, just does it, which I admire about her. Um, other than that, I think we're a little bit different. I think. Jane's pretty cynical. Like her, I, I think she has to work at optimism. I have to work at cynicism. Um, yeah, I would say that that was kind of our. I do think as a, if I was though a mom, I would be a similar mom to Jane. I, I, I really admire how she is a mama. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. She is. A, she's a really good mom. She's a great mom, and she's you know she's given up a lot for that kid. I'd like to think that I'd sleep on the couch and give the kid my bed. <laughs> I don't know that I would do that, but Absolutely not. I'd like to think I would. <laughs>
I have a two-year-old and there's absolutely no way. Yeah, there's no way. I'll never, my cousin had a baby and we were eating dinner and the, we had the best bite of the whole meal. The kid was like one, it will never remember the bite of this food. And she <laughs> saved it for the kid. Wow. And I just looked at her and I was like, I will never be that mom. I won't, like, the kid can have the frozen peas. It's one. It won't remember. Right. And she was It'll like, smear it on its but face. it's so good. <laughs> good for her. <laughs> I know. I know. Wow. Very impressive. Yeah. Um, Inspiring. You're, <laughs> you're producing now. Um, if you had to pick that or acting, which would it be? Oh. For right now, it would be producing. Why? Um, because it's so fun. It's kind of like being uh, an orchestrator, you or a, an orchestrator. That's not the right word, but it's it's like it's like being a conductor. You pick all the different pieces of the puzzle, you put them together, and then you pray that it they work together and that they like each other. And then if they do, you let it go and you let it do its thing, and then kind of keep it on course if it goes over budget or whatever. But what I love so much about producing is the creative elements involved, and I think sometimes as an actor. I'm trying to now only work on projects where this doesn't happen, but it's still inevitable. Like as an actor, the creativity can get a little bit lost because of certain other elements and, um, or li not lost, just limited. I guess there's like, it can feel limiting. And as a producer, I feel like there, the creative creativity is limitless. Like the amount of magic is just completely infinite. Um, and I'm really, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a business person, so the yeah. business side of it really gets me going. I, I mean, it's like it. being in charge versus being told what to do to some degree. Yeah, but also being like uh, in charge, not as an artist, but as like a business person. Yeah. So uh, as an actor, you can go to the director and you go, let's collaborate. As the producer, you could go, what do you think about this? And if they say no, you kind of got to go, but what do you think about this? If they say no, you go, okay, <laughs> I trust you, you're the director, you know? Like, and I kind of love that. I love... I just love artists and I love mad people and, you know, putting them and just creating that, that <laughs> I use the word space a lot. You've really made I'm me sorry, realize that. I'm no, sorry. it's fine. It's making me laugh. But like creating the space for all of that to exist is kind of, it's fun. Um, okay. And I've saved the best question for, I don't, it's not the best, but it's, they're all, they're all great. They're all equally good. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, but it's um, maybe the most controversial. Um, out of the entire cast of Big Little Lies, who are you most excited to work with? On something else? No, no, on Big Little Lies. I assume oh. on Big Little Lies. Um, Before it, it all started. Ooh, that is so hard. I mean, Zoe, I wasn't excited, to be honest, because we'd worked together on three other projects already. <laughs> um, I was excited to work with her as a friend. Um, but, I, I just I knew what our uh, our dynamic was going to be. Um, Laura, I had already worked with, so I was excited. But again, I kind of knew what that was going to be. It was really Reese and Nicole. Um, I was excited to work with both of them for very different reasons. Nicole is in my favorite of mov movie of all time, which is Moulin Rouge, and so just simply like being around. Satine was going, it was like <laughs> this very exciting prospect for me. Um, Understandable. Oh God, right? Um, and then Reese, because she was in like the movies that, like some of the movies that I did grow up with, like Sweet Home Alabama, and you know, the, the movies that made you feel like you were eating a warm apple pie when you watched them on TV. And um, so yeah, I guess I was just, but again, like even with them, they're just so rad and they're such cool, groovy people that you kind of forget I'm working with Satine or a legally blonde chick and I'm working with <laughs> like, you know, these two really... Meryl. That woman. <laughs> that one. Um, yeah, M Mama Mia. Um, <laughs> no, you just, you just kind of, I don't know, you don't, it doesn't, you don't feel like you're working with them as these kind of legends because yeah. they're just such normal people, you know? And that's something that I felt very lucky to experience because I think the world, like you never, you never get to see them as that, that way because we all kind of have to put on, we all have our own different self-defense and protective mechanisms and um, I, get, I get to know them in a very intimate way and that feels very special. Awesome.
Mm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This thank you guys for coming out on a Monday night. Yeah, in the rain. In the rain. Yeah. <laughs>